Hello, folks. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. I'm Susan Downs. We're a nonprofit. Our website is www.s, as in Silicon, V is in Valley, H is in Health, I is in Institute.com, where all of our speakers' um, presentations are, are placed unless they get censored. So um, feel free to donate, join. You can join on our website. Our newsletter is on our website. So tonight we have Dr. Adil Tel Oran, uh, basically known as Dr. T. Um, he's um, done many things throughout the world. He's a renowned health pioneer, inventor, focusing on natural principles, has lots of knowledge. He focuses on health and sustainability. He's an educator, physician, University professor, holistic scientist, and humanitarian. Welcome, Dr. T. Nice to be here. Thank you. And uh, today, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the topic is about uh, the health of the skin and how we can assess it and improve it with the utilization of uh, lab tests that the reveal about. The topic the is your choice. Okay, yeah, I believe that was the choice because um, I, I was leaning towards three different options that I thought, okay, we, we'll just choose this one for now and next time we could do a different topic. So today it will be about appearance and your skin's health and how your skin appears um, as it relates to specific lab tests that can be done uh, that are going to reveal much about your skin's health and what we can do to improve it. And uh, a caveat here is that people tend to separate the skin from the rest of the body. And uh, skin science has not reached maturity yet because of this uh, short-sightedness and the tendency of skin practitioners to isolate the skin and treat it as an organ that is uh, separated from the rest of the body when it comes to, to diseases. When in reality, almost every disease that afflicts the skin actually afflicts the inside of the body just as much. But we only have the ability to visualize the skin. So we focus on that manifestation instead of understanding that the skin projects onto us what's happening inside of the body uh, in that it's not just the shell, but also an, a critical organ that is um, similar to the liver in many ways. I always say that the skin is our second liver. It's also our third brain. After the central nervous system and the gut, the skin is indeed the third brain. And the skin also is a, a very important organ of uh, glandular secretion, hormonal secretion, productivity of hundreds of nutrients that the entire body utilizes. Uh, the skin is uh, also an organ of excretion. But most of all, uh, what makes it primer, primary is the fact that we can see it. And therefore, it is the number one reflector on our general health. So any test that we would run to check skin's health would also have to look for general bodily function and general wellness, being that they are inseparable from one another. And if we're going to look at causes for skin degeneration, loss of appearance of the skin, dryness, uh, wrinkling, and so on, we always see that uh, these types of degenerative changes of the skin are related to the same degenerative changes which we see everywhere else in the body. For example, inflammation. When the whole body is inflamed, the skin will be inflamed too because it is another organ of the body and there's no reason why it wouldn't be inflamed at the same time. So we would want to look for inflammatory processes inside the body through laboratory testing, knowing that this will reflect on inflammation within the skin as an important organ. 
Um, also, if we look for nutrient deficiencies, for free radical damage, and so on, um, omega-3 fatty acid uh, composition, all of those things are important for our entire physiology, but are especially going to be recognized when the skin is affected because that's the only organ we see. If we have tiny little red dots on the skin or if we have skin tags growing on top of our skin, they seem like they are skin issues, but they are not. We know that we have estrogen receptors in those skin tags and therefore they respond to estrogen stimulation. So this is true for the whole body, not just for the skin. But we only see it on the skin, so we make an issue of it because we care a lot about our appearance. But do we know what type of growth we have inside our body that are also suffering from the same estrogen receptors and are growing un un invisible to our eyes? We don't. So the skin gives us a great input and a window into what's happening inside our body. And if there's a problem with the blood vessels, capillary um, uh, flow of blood and so on, we're going to have the same damage occurring in the skin as we would expect elsewhere in the body. But the skin is where we're going to see it first. For example, when we have lipofushin accumulation in the skin, which is what we call age spot, so lipofuscin accumulation is a sign of degeneration, which we also see in the brain when people have Alzheimer's disease. But the first sign might just be having age spots. We don't know what's happening in the brain, but the skin is giving us a clue that some things are happening. So what kind of tests uh, do we like to look at to first and foremost, evaluate the inflammatory processes in the body. And we have to go to the one organ that represents 75% of the immune system, since that's the organ where inflammation will be first noticed, uh, first having its clinical impact, and that would bleed, bleed into the skin. So that will be the gut. If we want to find out about skin health, we have to find out what's going on in the gut in terms of inflammation. So I'm going to try and share with you. Now I am trying to get back into this lab test. And if not, I'll do it from memory because I don't really need it. I thought it would help you visualize um, now you're just seeing a long list, right? That's right. Okay. We're seeing your desktop. So if you pull something up on your desktop, we'll see it. Okay, maybe that would help. All right. Um, we see a bunch of test results. Estradiol, progesterone, FSH, testosterone. Okay, yeah, all right. Let's start with this one. Um, because I was talking about the digestive system. All right. So. Um, if we want to look at the inflammatory parameters of the gut, um, which as I said earlier, would be very important for understanding inflammatory processes affecting the skin, both directly and indirectly, we have to look at various inflammatory markers, which are not typically found in most laboratory tests available today in the US. Um, for example, if you look at um, histamine, in this case, the patient does not have elevated histamine in the stool. But DAO, which is an enzyme that breaks down histamine, diamine oxidase, is elevated, 212, which means that this person has ups and downs of histamine, which means that the average histamine level is high. When the average histamine level is high, we know that the gut is inflamed, and we know that there is a spillover of the histamine 
into the circulation and it will affect the skin. So a lot of time people will have itchiness and rash, eczema, pruritis uh, in the skin, and it will be relevant to excessive amount of histamine in the gut, which in a regular histamine test, it might not show. As in this case, if this is similar to having a glucose test, which would appear normal, but hemoglobin A1C is elevated, indicating that the average glucose level over the last several weeks is actually high. So DAO presents us with the information equivalent to hemoglobin A1C, in that it's telling us the histamine is on average too high because DAO stays high much longer even when the histamine level goes down. So people who are still in the up and down mode of histamine, they haven't gotten to a constant uh, elevation of histamine. This DAO, which is very unique test for, uh, for inflammatory processes, can indicate that the person he is suffering from histaminosis even when the histamine level itself appears normal. And in many of the patients that I have tested, histamine level was very high, so I didn't need to rely on DAO. But at least in a third of the patients, DAO is elevated, but histamine is not high enough because we just didn't catch it in the right time. So that's a very important test for inflammation that obviously affects the skin. And here we have another issue which affects the skin, serotonin. Serotonin, when it tested in the stool, can indicate that there is a food intolerance, but not only that. Since most of the serotonin in the body is manufactured by the gut, more than even in the brain, um, it's very interesting to note that, uh, at least from clinical experience, a lot of people who suffer from serotonin deficiency, as I see in other tests, um, make a lot more serotonin in the gut, as if the gut is compensating for a deficiency in serotonin. And it's interesting also that people generally, um, when they have sleep disturbances or when they don't wake up to go outside to the sun, have a serotonin imbalance, obviously, because the blue light of the sun is the greatest um, uplifter and the, capa the most capable method to increase your serotonin level dramatically within just 10 minutes of sun exposure around sunrise. So this becomes an indicator for, for therapy, for management of the patient. You can tell the patient, to wake up and go for a walk for 30 minutes around sunrise and immediately after sunrise, they'll get all the benefit. And usually people who are not getting that benefit are the ones who wake up and need to have their cup of coffee. If you need to have your cup of coffee first thing in the morning, you are dehydrating your body because coffee is a diuretic, so your skin becomes drier and you become dependent on an external stimulant instead of doing what nature intended for us to do, which is to be in the sunlight as soon as the day breaks to start the day activity. So this is a very important messenger for us, the serotonin in the stool. Uh, Dr. T, can I ask you, uh, uh, who does this test? What's the lab that you're talking about here? Um, that's a lab test that I send to Germany. I send the stool to Germany. And all my patients do that. And anybody who wants to do this test can simply contact um, the uh, email address that you saw on the original screen, uh, clinic at ecopoietan.com, and order the test for themselves or for their patients. So we, uh, the Ecopoietan acts as the, uh, the intermediary to help uh, facilitate shipping the stool test to Germany. 
the Germans are far more advanced in, in many of those parameters that you don't see elsewhere. Um, so here's another interesting parameter, EPX um, or EDN, which indicates classical food allergies. A lot of people walk around thinking that they have food allergies and they're wrong because the vast majority of patients have a negative result here. But those who have a positive result can bank on it. They know that they have eosinophilic derived uh, factors which indicate that they have classical food allergies um, of the type that is uh, potentially severe. So it's good to know if you have it, but most people don't have it. They have sensitivities, they have adverse reactions to food, they have histaminosis, but not classical allergies. And it's important for people to know that, to empower them to be more accurate about the, their own diagnosis, instead of telling everybody how, how um, allergic they are to food. Here are other parameters. CRP in the stool is very important. Calprotecting is an old one. Zonulin is critical. And nowadays, I see at least 40 to 50% of my patients with zonulin being elevated. And when we say elevated, we could mean between 30 and 60, which is the borderline um, that was considered already the initiation of leaky gut or uh, gut permeability syndrome. But if you get closer to 60 and then cross over 60, this is legitimate, clinically verified by uh, clinical pathologists as leaky gut syndrome, you know, according to clinical pathologists in Germany, medical doctors who specialize in clinical pathology. So I pay attention if it's already above 30 as a borderline issue, which is pretty common, but above 60, it's legitimately pathological as a leaky gut syndrome. M2PK, I've been lecturing about that many times for, for years and years now as the most important screening test for colorectal cancer, which eliminates the need for colonoscopy as a screening tool. And in this patient, it is below the minimal uh, detectable amount, so we don't worry about colorectal cancer. But if that's elevated, it's a significant indicator of chronic inflammation of the gut. Now, if we look at uh, immune factors, this is very, very common problem. I, I'd say, I'd venture to say that 90% of the patients that I've tested over the years, so many, many hundreds of patients, have abnormalities with their gut immunity. Secretary IgA and beta defensin are um, the, the most accurate markers, but they also reflect on markers elsewhere in the body. Defensin is a molecule that is manufactured by other epithelial cells like the skin. So the skin makes its own defensins as the gut does. And defensins are antimicrobial peptides that our own mucous membranes manufacture um, against fungal toxins, bacterial or viral envelopes. And um, as you see in this patient, both are very, very low. And again, from clinical experience, I have defined immune dysfunction of the gut as having four stages. The first stage is where um, both markers are elevated, where the gut starts reacting to a stress factor. So they both will go up and that's a sign of functionality. The gut is doing its job in reacting to some offending element. After a while, though, the antibody production is the first one to suffer uh, because of deficiency of the nutrients necessary or deficiency of sulfur in the gut. Remember that sulfur is crucial for the manufacturing of antibodies. You cannot bind the heavy and light chains of antibodies together without sulfur. So many people, uh, the first deficiency will manifest as um, hypogammaglobulinemia A in the gut, insufficient 
gamma globulin A in the gut, and that would be the first thing to go down while beta defensin will remain very, very high. Then gradually it starts going down as well, the defensin, and at the last phase, we have both of them in the red, deficient. So this gives me a pretty good history of where the patient is with regard to the immune system of the gut, which as we say, represents 75% of the immune system of the entire body. This is very important. And it's important for the skin because the skin directly gets impacted by the immune system of the gut. Um, so these are things that can be therapeutically improved both through lifestyle measures and through dietary measures, as well as through specific supplementations. These are very important tests that I do for every patient. Now, I didn't cover every aspect, but sometimes it's interesting to note um, what microbes we're looking for. And we are looking for microbes that are clinically relevant. We do know that many labs today offer PCR testing for, stool, um, for long, long list of uh, microbes, but those are very limited in clinical value, just like PCR is very limited clinically when you test for an, a new infection without naming names. Um, and that's because PCR will only detect fragment of a DNA, but not necessarily a quantifiable clinical situation of pathology. So it's better to have tests for microbes that are clinically relevant so that you can do something about it instead of see a huge forest from which you cannot isolate the trees. So here we focus on the most important physiological anaerobes and aerobic flora. And in many cases, when E. coli is severely deficient, the physiological E. coli, we're going to have some pathology going on with other microbes which would cause inflammation or even autoimmune disease. So these are microbes that are triggers for autoimmunity. In this patient, there are none of those, but what we do have is Klebsiella, which can manufacture histamine. So now we have a correlation between the elevated DAO that we saw before and the histamine production, which will occur when a person is having excessive amount of Klebsiella species. And this is what we're seeing right here. Um, so that's a very important insight for therapy because then we have an aromatogram which looks at various um, therapies that could work against those microbes. And this is specific to Klebsiella. And in this case, we see that basal thyme tea tree oil and oregano would be the most effective um, therapeutic agents to somehow um, inhibit the growth of this Klebsiella species without creating um, the negative impact of antibiotics. So this is an example of a test that we can easily do just looking at the stool and um, giving people major benefit for skin health. Here's another one. Um, different findings. Here you see the Klebsiella is normal, but again you see the E. coli is extremely deficient. The physiological important E. coli that holds ground and prevent other types of pathogens from growing over. Here we see also deficiencies in anaerobes, uh, both bacteroides and lactobacilli. Um, and we can expect something bad to be occurring in the pathogenic list of microbes. And indeed, we see that E. coli of the pathogenic variety, both the, the biovar and the hemolytic type, are extremely elevated. 
And this is very unusual. I almost never see two types of pathogenic E. coli in such a high amount. And obviously, this could cause major trauma and inflammation to the gut. It requires therapy. We need to use appropriate probiotics, appropriate spores, and also do something about this hemolytic E. coli to reduce the problem. In this test, I'm skipping. We're having issues with IgA being diminished, but defensin is pretty high. So this person is in a um, still very active phase of the gut. The gut is reacting. It's not dead yet immunologically. Um, so beta defensin is very, very high. That would also be a source of inflammation because um, it basically signifies that there is a significant immune response. Here we don't see histaminosis. DL is also normal, so that's not an issue. But we see severe inflammation with all three parameters. Zonulin is over 60, so we have legitimate, pathologically verifiable leaky gut syndrome. We have severe elevation of CRP, which I don't see very often, and calprotecting. And this is a rare situation where all three inflammatory markers are elevated simultaneously. And this patient has so much inflammation going on that they start developing cancer. M2PK is 15.6, normal is under four. So this is already the occurrence of colorectal cancer. And that's something that the patient should not be afraid of because if they follow all the instructions and they correct all the inflammatory processes, they have 99% chance of reversing this M2PK and going under four within three to six months from clinical experience of the last 17 years. So it's pretty easy to detect a colorectal cancer long before colonoscopy would show anything, helping people avoid the risks associated with colonoscopy and uh, getting really good results without having surgery, without losing part of their colon, without the fear of metastasis, because you catch it early. And studies have shown in Europe that 10% of the healthy population or so-called healthy population are walking around with a positive M2PK test and they don't even know it. 10%, which means that the colonoscopy is missing more than 99% of colorectal cancers. It only catches it when it's so advanced that it would justify a surgery, chemotherapy, and other extremely invasive approaches. But they're missing the 99% of colorectal cancers that are in the earliest phase that could easily be addressed and reversed without invasion and without trauma and toxicity. So this is a test that I would recommend for anyone over 30 because you can develop colorectal cancer for 20 or 30 years and not even know it because the colonoscopy would still be negative until it becomes significant enough, visible enough to show something. And obviously, if you care about your appearance, you want to retain your colon as much as you can because without healthy digestion, you're going to have so many inflammatory processes that would lead to anything from eczema to acne and destroy your skin's appearance. And you can normally tell when people have severe gut dysfunction, the skin also looks sick, looks pale, looks unhealthy. So even when we have M2PK positive, uh, we do want to address all of those inflammatory parameters and the hemolytic E. coli and treat it. And here we have an aromatogram 
for this specific microbe. So this is uh, an example of tests that we can do that would reveal a lot about your overall health and support also your skin. Now, uh, another very important uh, testing device for skin health will be looking for your hormones. Again, this is a test that I sent to Germany because I trust their technology. Um, they have, they're using slightly more expensive technology uh, than most labs in the US, which increases the accuracy. Plus, they are not as uh, tied down with the politics of the functional medicine movement within the United States where many labs are providing services and competing for services and the educators are being sponsored by those labs. So there is a conflict of interest with regard to the education that the people, that the doctors are receiving. So I avoid this altogether by sending this to Germany where they don't have this kind of, um, of a turf war and the tests are representing science and not wishful thinking. Uh, so for example, in the US, a lot of practitioners test hormones in saliva. And saliva is known for revealing some, a few hormones in their free, stat, in free state, unbound. The problem is when you start uh, providing therapy, when you give people hormone substitution, I don't like the term hormone replacement because it's very permanent, but hormone substitution is a lot more natural because it's more like a substitute teacher as opposed to a replacement teacher. So when we do hormone substitution, you cannot ever engage in a meaningful scientific monitoring of the results of the therapy because free hormones represent less than 1% of the total of each given hormone in the body. 99% is in the bound form. So most of what you're going to give people therapeutically is going to be found in its bound form. Therefore, you must test the serum and not the saliva if you're going to scientifically monitor the patient to find out the results of therapy and decide on continuation and modification of the dosing. Um, this is the scientific way to do it. Plus there are several hormones that you cannot even test in the saliva. So you're missing the big picture. So here we have 10 different sex hormones for women and we also have 10 sex hormones for men, slightly different. And those are crucial for the skin and for skin health. We know about estrogen receptors in the skin, we discussed that earlier. So we want to find out if a person is going to be um, suffering from deficiencies. Um, estrogen is also very important for skin, uh, um, general skin's health. So too much will cause skin tags and growths but insufficient amount of estrogen will cause dryness of the skin and a lackluster aging appearance. So you want to balance this, but it needs to be done in a way that would not present excess. And that's not so easy to do with guesswork. So we are not guessing when we do tests that look at the whole picture. You know, things like pregnenolone, Pregnenolone is a very important hormone to test. A lot of people are not testing for it on a regular basis yet, but um, it is literally a neurosteroid. It's, it's a steroid that protects the nervous system and helps with the myelinization process. Um, anything that protects the nervous system will also protect the skin because the nerves that supply the skin, um, that, that bring sensory input from the skin to the central nervous system, 
are also having a messaging effect on the skin itself and a trophic effect. They, they actually nourish the skin at the same time. So there is an interaction going on between the nervous system and the skin that makes the skin the third brain. And anything that is a neurosteroid, like um, pregnenolone, as well as the sulfated form of pregnenolone, which is very common in the blood. So if you don't have enough of both pregnenolone and sulfated pregnenolone, plus DHEA sulfate and DHEA non-sulfated, plus androstine dione, which we test in men but not in women, all of those neurosteroids are protecting our nervous system and therefore also are protecting our skin. And you see the effect when you have very low DHEA, you will have aging skin prematurely. When you don't have enough progesterone and pregnenolone, you will have wrinkles in the skin prematurely. So those things need to be balanced. And um, we call it HBST, hormone balancing and substitution therapy. HBST. It's unique in that we are looking at the holistic picture and telling people what they need to do first to balance themselves rather than immediately putting them on hormones, mega doses for life, creating the negative feedback loop that forces people to be dependent on external hormones that will never be exactly the same as what the body manufactures in terms of circadian rhythm, in terms of composition, quantities throughout the day, etc. So we want to allow all of those hormones to be manufactured in balance within the organism as much as possible in its natural form. So for example, if somebody has very low testosterone, as this person here does, what's, and obviously low testosterone will also result in aging and dry skin. So what are we telling the person to do? To immediately take testosterone supplement or testosterone um, drug prescription? No way. We want to minimize the prescription to when we actually have to in order to make the patient the healthiest possible. We first tell the patient what activities and what foods will enhance testosterone level. For example, what will increase your testosterone faster than anything? Sun exposure. Here we go back to the sun. Sun exposure, uh, and this has been shown many years ago in a scientific study, that when you expose your naked body to the sun, your testosterone level dramatically increase, especially if your genitals are being exposed which is something very few people do nowadays. Um, but testosterone is going to go very significantly higher and very likely to go into normal range or at least low normal range. And then the amount that we need to substitute would be pretty small. And then if we do some dietary aspect and reduce cortisol and improve DHEA, we may manufacture even more testosterone to the point where a supplement or a drug will not be necessary at all. So you have to look at all the constellations of um, potential improvements that could be generated in each individual to bring them to the greatest balance possible and then the sub substitution from the outside would only take the place of a Modi modifying agent at the end, you know, like to smooth the edges after we did the rough work through lifestyle, nutrition, and, and diet, which is how the body would, would want it. So that's HBSD. And each one of those affects the skin in a different way. I don't want to belabor that, but here's a serum test that we sent to Germany um, in, in uh, it's very hard to find all 10 hormones uh, available as an inexpensive panel. 
that will be done all in accurate serum form. And the benefit is in Germany, um, they encapsulate the hormones that you need based on the findings and based on um, some scientific, um, some scientists who have actually written a whole list of scientific ranges uh, of uh, ideal ranges for different age groups, which would allow people to exactly tailor made the treatment for each person. And they encapsulate those hormones by injecting the hormones into those capsules, and then the patient just has to pop a pill. And that's because many of these hormones, for example, pregnenolone, has been found to be far more effective when it's taken orally than when it's used as a cream. And today we have a lot of people using creams where the pharmacokinetics are very hard to predict. You don't know what the skin is doing, what's the fatty layer doing, what's the barrier like. If the skin could be so changed from day to day, from morning to evening, from stress to non stress, from winter to summer, and people's skin health could be uh, traumatized um, by so many things that we do today, like uh, living in very dry environment in the winter or in the summer because of heating and cooling or because of using soap, uh, or because of problem with the circulation of the skin, all of those would change completely the result of the treatment. And we don't know what works and what doesn't unless we provide things orally. And it's very easy for the patient to be compliant because he or she are receiving the entire array of hormones that they need based on the result, which can then be monitored in exactly the same way three months later or six months later to see the improvement and decide if we can taper off some of the hormones or stay with only a few of them and so on, modify according to, to the new tests, which allows the patient within a year to a year and a half to be literally optimal as opposed to just continuously guess guess working for from period of years which often happens in today's uh, hrt or bioidentical hormone approach uh, there's a lot of guessing and sometimes the patient feels better temporarily and then they don't and the doctors are basically continuously eyeballing it because they don't have sufficient um analysis that is worthy of monitoring of the actual th treatment. So these, these hormone tests are very important for skin appearance and skin health uh, uh, in general. Now there are other tests that are very important for the skin, uh, but not only for the skin. Uh, for example, anything that affects the nutrient level of, of the uh, that are, the nutrients that are metabolized by the body will also affect what is available to the skin. So if we do an organic acid test, which looks for 76 different organic acids, we can find out your NAC, N-acetylcysteine status, your glutathione status, your B12 methylmalonic acid status, uh, B1, B2, B5, B6, vitamin C, you can basically find out um, more accurately about your antioxidants and other essential nutrient status by measuring your, met your metabolic pathways and the metabolic results of having those nutrients in the body, which is more accurate clinically than trying to take a snapshot of the actual nutrients in a way that has not been scientifically validated yet. Yes, you can measure the blood for certain nutrients, but since the blood does not represent uh, where those nutrients are going to be stored 
it's not an accurate way to find out if you have enough of a certain nutrient. Or you can measure white blood cells or red blood cells uh, for nutrients, and that might be a little more accurate, but there are a lot of tests out there that utilize a single laboratory technique that has not been validated scientifically enough that we would know that the test actually represents what is being told to the patient. So sometimes you don't need all the nutrients. You just need to have a good representation of them. And the organic acid test covers it pretty nicely while also covering at least 65 or 70 other parameters, many of which are important for skin health. For example, we look for ketones. Ketones in the urine would indicate if you have more ketone bodies that you have also more AGEs, advanced glycation end products, because many of the ketone bodies are themselves AGEs. AGEs are some of the worst inflammatory substances that lead not just to inflammation, but also to degeneration. And people with high amount of AGEs will be suffering from skin degeneration much faster than those who avoid AGE-rich foods. The more AGEs you have, the more ketones you have, and vice versa, because ketones generate AGEs. And some ketones are themselves AGEs. So if you look up on the internet what AGEs levels are in different foods, you will see very readily what kind of foods will dramatically increase your amount of AGEs. And it will be kind of shocking that it's the same foods that are very, very popular on the ketogenic diet. So the more you eat ketogenic foods, and you'll see the list, it's always starting with meat, cheese, etc. Meat, cheese are the first eggs. Those are highest in AGEs. And those are the ones that are the first choice of eating for people who are on ketogenic diets. So whether or not those ketogenic diets are beneficial in the long run, the jury is still out. In the short run, we could easily show temporary benefits as the body goes through its cycling of emergency versus longevity. And, you know, whatever creates longevity is oftentimes the opposite of what helps you survive right now. Um, so take that into account. And at least with the organic acid test, we can tell you very easily what level of ketone bodies you have, and those will indeed affect your skin's appearance. Also, you can test your homocysteine level. That would dramatically affect your capillaries and therefore your skin's health because your skin's blood distribution will be limited. Uh, so that's a test that anybody could do anywhere. Um, another urine test that I would recommend if you are looking at general health and the skin in particular is a test for toxicities that you can easily address. So there are urine tests for environmental toxins like glyphosate. And we know that glyphosate is one of the major uh, newcomers in the factors that lead to skin cancer. Therefore, it also leads to inflammation because skin cancer derives from chronic inflammation in the lower layers of the epidermis. Therefore, when you create um, toxic environment for the skin, when you use all those lotions and creams and uh, other types of uh, you know, perfumes and things that contain different preservatives and foaming agents 
and colorings and different things that they put in oils and cream that people smother their body with, those would um, oftentimes create inflammation in the skin. And that would lead to a problem. And so obviously if we can test for some of those environmental toxins that are in many products that we use, but are also coming in touch with our skin through clothing, through the air, through water, there are things that we can do to reduce the exposure. And that is especially crucial for the skin because the skin is our main barrier towards the outside environment and almost any toxin, whether microbial or environmental or technological or industrial, all of those will dramatically affect the immune system of the skin and create an inflammatory effect. While people are blaming the sun for all those issues that they have with their skin, uh, it's very easy to see that there are people in the world who are in the sun a lot and their skin stays intact. Uh, so that's by itself a proof that if you protect your skin and reduce, uh, reduce its inflammatory processes, you will maintain healthy skin even if you do what you're supposed to do, which is get some sun exposure. I'm in the sun every day for hours. When I'm in my home, I farm all day long. I, or I weed or I just, I love being out there in the sun for hours and hours. Of course, I would never use any creams or SPF products. So I never even use soap. And the skin does not get damaged. Only when you combine all of those inflammatory processes with the sun, you can start generating problems. And when you are burning in the sun without first developing a healthy tan, that would be an issue. And that's um, obviously easy to avoid. Just build up the tan and don't stay in the sun too long until the skin can handle it. Because those 25 minutes that you spend in the sun initially actually helped your DNA repair itself in the skin. So the sun protects you because that's how it works in nature. Things that cause damage, if they're natural, they also cause benefit at the same time. They somehow balance themselves, but they can't do that if you have other issues of imbalance that are introduced because of an unhealthy lifestyle. So I test most of my patients using um, the urine to measure their glyphosate and other environmental toxins uh, because these directly lead to lifestyle changes that they will comply with when they see which elevated uh, parameters they have. But even more important, I would test them for mold toxins. Mold toxins are a major newcomer in, uh, in the field of health. Uh, and now that we can measure the extent of exposure, and it's kind of shocking how many patients have severe elevation of certain mold toxins that affect their entire body. For example, okra toxin elevation I see in about 70% of the patient that I tested. And in most of them, it's extremely elevated. It's like 95th to 99th percentile. Um, and that's a liver toxic agent. It's hepatotoxic, it's nephrotoxic, so it affects the kidneys, which obviously will affect the skin. It's also neurotoxic, and it suppresses the immune system. How are all those things not going to affect your skin and its appearance? There's another one that I see pretty often. It's called citrinin, which comes from aspergil uh, aspergillus and penicillium um, and other types of uh, mold. And they lead directly to kidney pathology. And they enter the body through the skin, damaging the skin in the process. So it's good to know. Um, about these things and 
they, these, it, these things cause cancer in, in studies of rats and other animals. Uh, another one that's really interesting is uh, a, a, a chemical called xeralanon, which you can also find in the, uh, in the same test. And um, that um, is an estrogenic compound that is far more estrogenic than soy. And it inhibits the detoxification pathway in the liver called glucuronidation which makes more and more people estrogen dominant and at risk of estrogenic type cancers because they're not processing their estrogen effectively in phase two detoxification in the liver. That's as a result of being exposed to a mold that um, can be in the air, can be with, from water damage in the house, but increasingly today in foods. So many foods that we eat uh, th that have been in storage for a long time, like barley and wheat and corn and rice uh, that are major staples, if we eat them in large quantities without um, the kind of a modification or soaking them in food grade hydrogen peroxide, or filtering or doing some other things to them to reduce the exposure, we are going to accumulate those mold toxins. Remember in nature, we wouldn't be storing so much food. We would just be eating what's available. We would be gathering our food. So today we're using too much of these grains in large quantities and they all are being stored. We have to do something to the food to reduce the risk. And many of those foods that are in storage, even if they were not GMO, even if they were not sprayed while they were growing, in storage they get sprayed because they still need to have a shelf life and they get all type of toxins uh, on top of them. So another reason to focus on organic food as much as possible, even though it's not a perfect thing either, but it's better. And we have to take that into account. And when people see severe mold toxin elevation in their body, um, and usually they have one or two of the entire uh, array of uh, mold toxins. So they have to specify the treatment to, the, to those specific mold toxins. So this uh, xeralanone responds pretty well to supplements like lycopene and resveratrol are going to be helping increase the glucuronidation and reduce the negative impact on the immune system like spleen atrophy, uh, thymus atrophy, and uh, insufficient productivity of white blood cells. All of those things that people would normally not connect with mold toxins are actually connected even neurotransmitters like dopamine production and dopamine um, metabolism could be dramatically inhibited by some of those mold toxins, which would change entirely your outlook on life. So not just the appearance of your skin. So there are many other tests um, that can be done, but I always try to test people for things that I would not be able to guess. I don't want to test people for stuff that I would guess anyway, that they have going on, because it's a waste of their money. And we need to use their money in the most efficient way, clinically, that is relevant to the changes we want to make in their life. Uh, so I don't test very often for omega-3 composition even though it's a good test, but it's so easy to change it. In, in two days, the result will be different if you change your diet. So why should I test for something that the patient can easily improve dramatically and the test won't be valid anymore within a day or two? Only if a test is refusing to be compliant and make the changes that would be 
helping their omega-3 composition, which is very important for skin appearance, only if they are not willing to be compliant, I would consider uh, doing that test just to prove the point to them so they would be willing to make the changes. So that's an example of a test that I would not normally do, but I'm aware of it. I would not normally do all the autoimmune markers because most of them are not clinically relevant. They are diagnostically relevant, but not therapeutically relevant. And in most cases, they will come negative. But an exception to that would be thyroid. Does thyroid have direct effect on your skin? Absolutely. We all know that hypothyroidism is a major cause of hair loss, dry skin, thinning skin, thinning hair, etc. So thyroid is another panel that I like to do. And again, I do it in Germany. Um, I, I like to look at a panel of at least six different parameters with an additional two parameters as add-ons in certain cases where the patient justifies. For example, uh, thyroglobulin, I will not test on everyone. Thyroglobulin antibodies, I will. But thyroglobulin, you don't want to test on everyone because that's relevant for thyroid destruction. Uh, and I'm not going to do reverse T3 on everyone, but on some people it might be relevant. However, the other six I do on everyone, including three types of antibodies. One is the common one against thyroglobulin, the other against thyroperoxidase, and the third is against thyroid release hormone receptor. So there are antibodies against TRH, which are not typically tested. Uh, I'm willing to bet that most of you have not heard of TRH antibodies for basically receptors that are in the pituitary gland. And if we have a problem with an autoimmune disease affecting the pituitary, of course it's going to affect your TSH production, which will change your whole thyroid picture, even if all the other antibodies the typical ones, are normal. And even when T3 and T4 appear normal. So um, that is relevant to the skin. And if people want to do a thyroid panel, I recommend to do it in Germany. It's not expensive, but it's very comprehensive. It gives you a lot more information and anybody could do it anytime. The urine test I mentioned, are all done in the US. So you don't have to send anything to Germany for that. Um, what are the tests? Um, there are tests for infectious agents, you know, like Lyme's disease. Does Lyme disease affect the skin? Initially it does. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it, the correlation is significant as much as it is in the nervous system. And we, as we said before, the nervous system is connected to the skin. So neuro, neuro Lyme, which is the imitator of neurosyphilis, will definitely affect the skin. So they do a test that is um, immunoblot, which is far better than Western blood that we do in the US. Uh, they're not just looking for the typical ELISA testing, but for a step above it that makes the results more accurate. So people who are likely to not find out about their Lyme disease will be more likely to find out if they do have antibodies um, that would indicate that they have been exposed to Lyme. Um, and it would be still within the realm of medically accepted mainstream pathology, uh, which, you know, it's still the golden standard. I know that sometimes we have to go more into the functional realm, but it's nice when we are using things to give people an assessment or evaluation about their health, 
that we know that something is accepted by mainstream scientists uh, all over the world. It adds a little extra level of, uh, of confidence. So these are the tests that I would, that I wanted to talk about today with regards to improving the appearance, longevity, and uh, regeneration of the skin. It's all a part of the bigger picture, uh, which we could do at a different time. We can talk about um, the Rambo centers that are being slowly created around the country. Rambo stands for Regenerative Anti-Aging Medicine and Biochemical Optimization, Rambo. So the Rambo centers are basically a composite of everything in lifestyle, nutrition, nourishment, every aspect of psychology, sociology, physiology that would affect our ability to stop the degenerative process and start regenerating all the way to injection of stem cells and PRP and other more invasive approaches at the, at the uh, tail end. But most of this stuff is based on lifestyle changes that are pretty involved and some lab testing that help optimize the human biochemistry and also including activity that will optimize appearance because we know that when people have healthy looking appearance, they also feel more healthy internally and emotionally when they look in the mirror, if they are encouraged by what they see and they're proud and they feel good about themselves, they end up a lot more healthy and they actually manifest longevity much better than those who look in the mirror and see themselves wilting. So these tests are helping us in slowing down the wilting process and in maybe even avoiding wilting altogether and regenerating the robust plant life that we like to, uh, to represent ourselves with before the wilting takes place. So any questions? Yes, we have several. I want to encourage people to raise their hand if they want to ask questions directly. Um, uh, the first question, um, is the M2PK test becoming um, mainstream um, anywhere? It has been mainstream for the last 25 years in Germany and adjacent European countries. In the US, it simply was ignored inexplicably. There's no reason for it except for politics and perhaps profit. Well, profit, especially from colonoscopies, um, because you know the gatekeepers are people who are supposedly the experts in their field, and they are the ones who determine what test everybody should have, and those tests profit themselves. So it's an obvious conflict of interest, and maybe that's why M2PK has never made headways. But I have been using the M2PK with, with everybody in, that I know in the U.S. for the last 17 years. Uh, how about the uh, urine test for uh, glyphosate? Uh, how um, reliable is it in terms of testing what's going on now versus what has been going on for the last um, several months of one's life? Um, like most toxicological tests that, that when they're done in the urine, they show ongoing exposure and ongoing burden. Since it's metabolized and we see the metabolic end results in the urine, we can only represent uh, or reflect on recent exposure or if somebody has been exposed for many, many months, and accumulated toxicities, 
they will continuously be excreted through the kidneys into the urine and the higher the level, the higher the overall exposure. It's not going to differentiate uh, how long you've been exposed, but it will show the overall burden of exposure, at least in terms of what the urine is excreting right now. And is the one of the metabolites also measured, or is it just the uh, glyphosate? In this case, it's actually glyphosate, um, but other toxic chemicals that are measured in the urine are metabolites rather than the actual chemical, since many, many families of chemicals end up metabolizing into specific common pathways. So you don't have to test for 300 toxin, but to their end result and metabolites which represent them. John, how about you asking a question? Okay, to follow up on the glyphosate, uh, uh, would it help to take uh, on a regular basis uh, glycine to, um, to uh, remove the glyphosate that we're exposed to unavoidably? And also is decaffeinated coffee okay? Uh, so I only heard a comment and then a question. So the question was, if, is decaffeinated coffee okay? He also uh -huh. asked if um, um, glycine would have a competitive effect against glyphosate in terms of testing or therapy. Um, well, yes, uh, there are quite a few agents that could be used to reduce glyphosate toxicity and glycine would be one of them. Uh, if I tested and wanted to increase accuracy, I would avoid giving any related supplements for at least three days, two, or th two minimum, three days better before the test so that I could actually see what's normally occurring in that patient's body. Uh, and I would not tell them to make any changes. I want to see what they are in real life, just like they have been in the five years before they come to see me. So I would not provide any uh, competitors or inhibitors, cofactors or, or cleansers. I want to see what comes out because my comparative analysis is based on all the patients that I've seen over the years who were all starting from a baseline without intervention. Usually you don't have to repeat a test like that. You just have to teach them how to avoid glyphosate in every way possible. And that's the most that you, you can do clinically anyway. You know, there are some sources that we cannot eliminate because we, unfortunately, we have to breathe to live. So in, in, in that situation, you're going to have some glyphosate, nothing we can do about it. So I'm trying to be clinically as proactive as possible within the realm of common sense. And as far as caffeine and decaf, um, we know that when you decaffeinate, you sometimes use different chemical solvents to eliminate the, the caffeine in some cases. So there might be some other toxic elements resulting from the decaffeination process. Um, plus, there is another issue, which is um, you might be concentrating all the other methyl xanthines, which occur in caffeine, you know, like theophylline, theobromine, methyl xanthine. All of those are stimulants from the same family as caffeine, and they will also hijack the stimulatory pathway and uh, ending up causing us to be more. Uh, dependent on this source of serotonin instead of using the sun. So I generally don't like to play with nature. I prefer to wake up and be alert naturally. And I let the sun help me make the serotonin. And while it does that, it also creates a circadian rhythm that will protect me from about 100 diseases, all types of cancers and many other issues. When you take a stimulant from the outside and you 
fool around with your own productivity of serotonin, your circadian rhythm will be altered, your biological clock will not be the same, and you put yourself at certain risks. Of course, you can always find studies that show that caffeine is good for you, but those studies are correlational mostly, and um, it's very easy to see how you can change an average in terms of outcome instead of looking at in individual groups with a baseline that's different from one group to the next. It's the same problem with vitamin D. I can show you that when you take vitamin D supplement, on average, everybody will improve. But if I divided the groups by baseline, you would see that people who do not have vitamin D deficiency will not really benefit much from supplementation. And in fact, would actually be harmed by the supplementation. Harmed. But the benefit will be dramatic if they are significantly deficient. And unfortunately, all the intervention studies that were done so far did not isolate groups based on baseline levels. So nobody can really make the comparison to have a valid test interpretation. But that's for a different lecture. One day, I'll be happy to share with you why taking vitamin D supplements above a certain level actually harm your body and actually harms your skin because your skin, and that's why I like to test for vitamin D. Um, now you can do the, uh, the dry spot, you know, dry blood spot very easily at home to find out your vitamin D level, not because you care about vitamin D level, but because you care about what it represents. It represents, excuse me, the only marker we have on sun exposure. It tells us how much sun we had. That's more important than finding out how much vitamin D you have for the purpose of supplementation. So I like to test people because it gives me a much better reading on their skin health since the skin is supposed to manufacture their vitamin D. They're not supposed to get it from the mouth. At least 95% of vitamin D must be made by the skin in order for the skin to be protected and healthy. So by taking it orally, we're not allowing the skin to do its job. We are inhibiting it. We are uncoupling the productivity of one thing from many other things that should be manufactured simultaneously as nature intended with our own photosynthesis process in our own skin. So skin health requires manufacturing of vitamin D in the skin. And if we don't have enough vitamin D, according to the test, it means we need more sun. How also, about the, uh, yeah. decaf he asked about decaffeinated coffee and how about the mold risk of decaffeinated coffee? Oh, yes. Okay. That was uh, another aspect of it because uh, I mentioned coffee earlier. So I, <laughs> I understand now uh, the, the two different contexts here for coffee. Yes, absolutely. But you know, for people like me uh, and hopefully other people who are listening to nature more and less to uh, manufacturers, it's not even an issue because I, I never drink coffee. I mean, last time I had coffee was when I was five years old. So I, I forgot what it tastes like. And I think that for most people, it would be, it would be healthier if they learn to, to avoid it altogether. Um, but absolutely, the more the, the more the beans have been in storage, the more mold is going to grow on them. And I haven't seen any studies showing the amount of mold in decaf versus non-decaf. Maybe somebody else has seen a study about that. I don't think anybody has decided to study that. Can you briefly touch on the TRH antibodies um, and how often you see those autoimmune um, problems compared to <coughs> the, the thyroglobulin or thyroperoxidase? Uh, they're not, obviously, they're not occurring often. But when they do, it's very important. Um, 
<coughs> I'm getting dry here. Yeah, you need a sip of water or yeah, something or a, a, an <coughs> inhale of a of a plant oil. <coughs> yes. <laughs> I just I just flew in and after uh, seeing twelve hundred and fifty patients in New York in in seven days. Plant, plant stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I uh, wanted to ask next was about the issue of how do you assess and deal with um, heavy metal issues? Uh, it's a very interesting question. It requires a pretty lengthy discussion. Um, you know, in the past, we all did the uh, urine provocation. Um, then the uh, Institute of Functional Medicine decided that it's not the best way, and now they're going into just doing red blood cell analysis, <clears throat> which is not as accurate as I'd like it to be. So it feels like at this point, the field is wide open to the different methods of diagnosis. What I find is, and here the water is arriving. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I have water. It's a long flight from uh, West Palm Beach to San Francisco nowadays. Yeah, and the low air pressure can certainly dry out your sinuses and airways. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so nowadays, I test people less for heavy metals and treat them more. I, I basically treat their, I, I assume that they have heavy metals because whenever I did provocation studies in the past, everybody had elevation of at least mercury, lead, arsenic, um, uh, even a lot of um, things like, uh, you know, nuclear type heavy metals. Uh, I've seen quite a lot of those. And so I decide that it's not a test I want to do as often anymore because I'm pretty sure that if I did the provocation, a lot of heavy metals are going to come out. Uh, so I decided to start treating it without actually um, measuring it. And I'm doing it very, very gently together with other types of detoxification and lifestyle changes uh, because I, I'm a firm <coughs> believer in the fact that as long as toxins come into your body, your body will not eliminate what's already accumulated before, beforehand. So there's no detoxification program that would be efficient unless you truly eliminate all incoming toxins at the same time. So for at least a period of two months, three months, no incoming in order to slowly leach out the toxins that have accumulated. So heavy metals are no different in that. And the treatment would obviously have to be multifactorial include inhibitors and supporters and um, enhancers of NAC and glutathione and uh, alpha lipoid and, um, uh, and other clathrating agents uh, in addition to um, inhibitors or, or competitors like uh, minerals, you know, healthy good minerals in large quantities could help uh, re replace the uh, heavy metals on the receptors. And a lot of sulfur, I always have to remind people that sulfur deficiency is probably the biggest mineral deficiency that, that in modern society we have today. Uh, and I know that I'm not the only one on this lecturing circuit mentioning sulfur, but I've been lecturing about it for many years now uh, because of the uh, you know, the amazing discovery of the sulfur rich black salt that made me say, hey, you know, we have a way to give people sulfur without even having to rely entirely on a supplement. 
here. And I have nothing against MSM and other sulfur-based supplements. They are great. But if people can also get it in their food, there's a, a great advantage because they're more compliant and they have um, ongoing exposure even when they forget to take their supplements or when they decide they don't want to spend money on them anymore. They have to eat salt anyway. If we go back to your uh, German hormone testing um, uh, discussion, um, does that company and that analysis provide you with pre-menopausal and post-menopausal norms for the profiles that they do? Yes, more than just the uh, pre and post. They give you at least 10 different norms based on age. And also they give you uh, the analysis based on treatment. So you know what to expect, for example, with Estron. Estron is usually occurring in very tiny quantities. Uh, and you don't expect it to be high and it's always in a state of equilibrium with estrogen, with estradiol, I mean. So um, with Estron, you normally expect, let's say, between 15 and 30 um, micrograms. Um, but if you are being treated therapeutically, you might be expecting in normal 3,000. So they give you all of that uh, so that you can make a better clinical uh, process, you know, clinical judgment. Um, and I'm sure that there's still a lot more to learn, but um, they have some scientists that have written extensively about the topic and created a lot of these uh, reference ranges that we use today uh, because we need something to work well with the intervention, especially when you're going to have a capsule that contain within it all the different hormones at the right ratio that is appropriate to your test findings. Um, how do you um, assess um, mineral electrolytes and trace mineral status? Uh, those are typically done either in red blood cells or in, you can combine things. Sometimes I use hair analysis and I combine it with red blood cells because I can't rely on one by itself. Since the hair is susceptible to external contamination, uh, I like to rely on it more for deficiencies than for excesses. So if you have a deficiency in say lithium, which is very, very common today. Actually, almost everybody I test is deficient in lithium, so I'm all, I almost stopped testing and I assume that they will be deficient. It's similar to iodine in certain population groups. Uh, lithium is very important for neurological function and um, almost always it will be deficient. So that I can rely on because the contamination will lead to excesses versus the reality, but not to deficiency. So I rely on the deficiency states uh, with hair, uh, whereas with a red blood cell minerals, I rely, I rely for other things, you know, like magnesium and other minerals. And I, then I compare with the hair and see if there is any kind of uh, cross validity. How about uh, eczema issues in uh, infants and children? Uh, do you run across that much and what's your approach? Uh, I run across it uh, way too often. Uh, it, in fact, nowadays it's almost the norm. Almost every baby and small child has eczema at least some time throughout their life. Uh, and uh, you know, Inflammation of the skin is always a reflection of a problem internally, as we said earlier. So the management has to start from the inside. I want to know if they have histaminosis. I want to know if they have gluten sensitivity or other intolerances. I may do some uh, temporary mono diets or nutrient dense fast or elimination diets. 
I would uh, look to see if they have contact dermatitis or direct exposure to the skin of certain t toxic or noxious agents. You know, the trick is to do a little detective work, figure out what are the likely culprits and eliminate them instead of directly relying on therapeutic regimens that don't address those causative agents. But I would always combine it with one therapy, which is which the absence of will be causative. And that's again, sun exposure. Most skin problems that are eczematous are enhanced by the limited inhibition of immune cytokine production resulting from insufficient sun exposure. So when you are exposed to solar rays, you are actually inhibiting inflammatory cytokines. You're inhibiting the migration of B and T lymphocytes into the lymph nodes where a major immune, uh, immune reaction would occur, leading to a retrograde inflammation in the skin around those lymph nodes. So the sun inhibits that, and that's why being exposed to the sun is the best thing you can do to avoid excessive inflammatory response of any kind, not just the skin. Going all the way into the body for autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases start with the skin, by the way. All of those children with eczema or asthma or atopy, atopic dermatitis or other form of eczematous dermat uh, conditions, they go through a phase and suddenly the symptoms disappear and their parents are overjoyed to see that the problem that the child had for the last five years is suddenly gone as the child goes through puberty. And you see it clinically quite often, those children that used to have asthma and suddenly the asthma disappears and whatever therapy you engaged in at the time will get all the credit. But in fact, you would have seen the condition disappear anyway, even without any therapy. Why? Because there is a point where the inflammatory condition is internalized by the immune system, where the T and B lymphocytes are sending their cytokines and themselves into other organs where other portions of the immune system like monocytes and uh, you know, macrophages and so on are being recruited and now slowly the problem is no longer manifested in the skin and you can be very happy about it for two or three or four years and then suddenly the same child gets diabetes type one or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or severe psoriasis or something else that is much more global and resulting from allowing the autoimmune condition to internalize while avoiding the causes that made the skin show us the first signs of this condition that is evolving. Got a question here that might be more about dyslexia, but. Um, what is HPSD from the hormones discussion? And I'm not sure if that might be SHBG, but um, sex HPSD? binding HPSD? No, it's uh, sex binding hormone or sex binding globulin. Yes, sex hormone binding globulin, but yes. yeah, okay. So <laughs> um, uh, how do you check for, let's say, gluten sensitivity or do you? Very good question. Um, I, I do a, a two-tier approach. The first tier is to find out if legitimately any scientist, any medical doctor, gastroenterologist would agree that that person has uh, either gluten sensitivity or celiac. For that, I don't do the blood test because that's totally unreliable and you're going to miss 90%. Uh, the same stool sample that I sent to Germany, I add to it the um, um, 
anti-gliadin antibody and uh, anti-transglutaminase antibody testing in the stool, looking for IgA antibodies. However, that's not always accurate because sometimes, especially today, IgA antibodies are extremely low because of the suppression of the immune system we discussed earlier. So in situations like that, at least I give it a try. I want to see if the person is pathologically accepted by the mainstream because the patient wants to know that. They want to know if it's, if it's real or if it's only these weird doctors that are finding that he has those, these conditions, right? So I'm going to give the patient both sides of the picture. The first thing would be this, uh, sending it to Germany because it would be legitimate clinical pathology accepted by the whole world. But in many cases, it comes negative. I showed you earlier a sample of that where there was negative test for that specific um, uh, parameter. So, however, I've seen enough patients with severe clinical symptoms as in a baby who was five years old, who was a whole head shorter than his twin sister because he failed to thrive. And all the doctors in Boston, in Manuel, in you know, the, the pinnacle of the world where all parents take their children to the pediatricians in Boston who are considered the best in the world, who, who basically said, we cannot find what's wrong with your child. And they tested for gluten sensitivity. And they told the, the mother that the child will simply end up failing to develop and will stay retarded. There was no growth even an iota. I mean, stayed the same sandals for several years. So in that situation, Another test that I do regularly that's also looking for antibodies in the stool, but here in the United States, showed palliative finding, both for celiac and for gluten sensitivity and for a few other types of foods. And that test changed that child's life. And within a month, all of his screaming every night with a bloating stomach disappeared, actually less than a month. And he started growing really fast. And after a year and a half, he almost caught up, caught up to his sister. So we know that a lot of time people end up with negative tests for anti-gliadin antibodies, anti-transglutaminase antibodies, but it doesn't mean that they're not gluten sensitive or that they're not celiac. You just have to do a more sensitive test. And there is a lab in Texas that I used in those situations where I need to verify. I don't do it for everyone. But in those cases where there are significant symptoms that must be uh, bringing the patient into compliance, then I would do that test. And oftentimes, it shows the patient is sensitive uh, much more than any other test. So it's hard to miss a patient. It's, a, it's at least 50% of the population that come positive with that test. So that's how I, I measure for these. And it's very important. In, in patients who are willing to go 100% gluten-free for a period of a month, um, we can avo avoid the test and see how it affects them. But then they will have to avoid other, um, you know, confounding changes that would make us not learn anything. So it has to be scientifically done uh, to, uh, you know, to really understand what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about cultivating sun exposure in terms of direct sun and indirect sun and uh, wearing hats and how much of your skin needs to be exposed and how you handle hot and cold weather and things like that. Okay, so this almost sounds like an entire lecture. <laughs> um, maybe we should just schedule a lecture dedicated to this topic 
um, and I will look at it from a different perspective. I know that everybody already has heard the typical perspective, but you know, I'll try to make it a little more interesting um, and answer all that because you know, each one of those questions has multiple answers. Some of them start with the word depends on, and um, obviously a lot of it will depend on the environment, the location, the latitude, altitude, pollution level, um, activities, time of the day. I mean, all of that uh, falls into play, but there are things that people are not aware of that I would like to bring their awareness to that are really interesting for people who are interested in physiology, uh, like you, Steve, I know that it's going to be extremely interesting to know that inappropriate sun exposure has nothing to do with the quantity, but the quality. For example, if you have imbalance between UVA and UVB, what's going to happen to the skin? People don't realize how much damage can occur where you make a lot of UVB, I mean, when you, when you expose a lot of UVB, but not enough to UVA. Everybody knows that UVA is a problem because it can go deeper into the tissue and affect the risk of skin cancer. But we need UVA for very specific reasons that would prevent skin damage and skin aging and skin inflammation when we have too much UVB in the absence of UVA. We have six votes for you to come back and talk about the sun. Oh, only six, so maybe I don't know if it's worth it. Well, that's 10% that's of the entire audience. Oh, okay, 10%. And, and some All of right. these people are shy, too. Oh, okay, if you're shy. <laughs> so raise your hand if you're shy. <laughs> then we will know. Okay, so one shy person raised her hand. And I know that she's not shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'll be happy to do this topic um, at, at a different time, and I'll I'll bring you a chart that I have created because it hasn't been created yet, and it was necessary to show people the importance of health vis-a-vis -vis sun exposure and vitamin D finding on blood tests. It's a, it's a completely different approach that's based on the most recent scientific knowledge and not the knowledge of the uh, late tens, the late teens of this century. You know, vitamin D and the sun have been through quite a lot of revolutions since the last 20, you know, in the last 20 years. And now we are finally getting to the third phase which I hope will be the last one, because it's the one that represents nature the most. So with that, I thank you for uh, being here and uh, thank you for your patience, especially with that uh, awkward technology moment at the beginning. Uh, and uh, hopefully it can be uh, erased somehow so that uh, the embarrassment will not be global. We can do that. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you all, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.